Hi and welcome to my lecture on shoulder dystocia. To download my lecture deck, please go to my WordPress site, Docino Bigaine. Reference for this lecture are the following. And this is the outline of my lecture. So shoulder dystocia happens when the anterior fetal shoulder becomes wedged behind the symphysis pubis and fail to deliver using normally exerted downward traction and maternal pushing. Because the umbilical cord is compressed within the birth canal, this dystocia is an emergency. Several maneuvers may be performed to free the shoulder, and this requires a team approach in which effective communication and leadership are critical. Consensus regarding a specific definition of shoulder dystocia is lacking. Some investigators have proposed that the head-to-body delivery time of more than 60 seconds be used to define shoulder dystocia. However, currently, the diagnosis continues to rely on the clinical perception that the normal downward traction needed for fetal shoulder delivery is ineffective. Shoulder dystocia poses a greater risk to the fetus than to the mother. The main maternal risks are serious perineal tears and postpartum hemorrhage, usually from uterine atony but also from lacerations. The neonatal injuries are far more serious, such as brachial plexus injury, clavicular or humeral fractures, asphyxia or acidosis, and hypoxemic ischemic encephalopathy, and sometimes even death. For the management of shoulder dystocia, now because of ongoing cord compression with this kind of dystocia, one goal is to reduce the head-to-body delivery time. The second goal is avoiding fetal and maternal injury from aggressive manipulations. An initial gentle attempt at traction assisted by maternal expulsive efforts is recommended. Adequate analgesia is certainly ideal. Some clinicians advocate performing a large episiotomy to provide room for manipulations. Episiotomy itself does not lower brachial plexus injury rates, but raises 3rd and 4th degree laceration rates. Now, episiotomy may be needed to complete the needed maneuvers. And here are some of the maneuvers we can do for shoulder dystocia. So the first maneuver is the suprapubic pressure or the Mazanti maneuver. As you can see in this picture, a suprapubic pressure is applied by the assistant while a downward traction is applied to the fetal head by the operator. Pressure is applied with the heel of the hand to the anterior shoulder wedged above and behind the symphysis. The anterior shoulder is either depressed or rotated or both. So the shoulders occupy the oblique plane of the pelvis. Here the anterior shoulder can be freed. The second maneuver is the McRoberts maneuver. This maneuver consists of removing the legs from the stirrups and sharply hyperflexing them up towards the abdomen. This maneuver should be done by your assistant and not the operator. Suprapubic pressure is often concurrently applied also by the assistant. Now this maneuver causes the straightening of the sacrum relative to the lumbar vertebra rotation of the symphysis pubis towards the maternal head and a decrease in the angle of pelvic inclination. Although this does not increase pelvic dimensions, pelvic rotation cephalad tends to free the impacted anterior shoulder of the fetus. The next maneuver is the delivery of the posterior shoulder. With delivery of the posterior shoulder, the operator carefully sweeps the posterior arm of the fetus across the chest followed by the delivery of the arm. If possible, the operator's fingers are aligned parallel to the long axis of the fetal humerus to lower bone fracture risks. The shoulder girdle is then rotated into one of the oblique diameters of the pelvis with subsequent delivery of the anterior shoulder. The next maneuver is a rotational maneuver which we call Wood's Corkscrew Maneuver. This is done by progressively rotating the posterior shoulder 180 degrees in a corkscrew fashion, then the impacted anterior shoulder could be released. Another rotational maneuver is the Rubin maneuvers. Rubin in 1964 recommended two maneuvers. First is the fetal shoulders are rocked from side to side by applying force to the maternal abdomen. If the first maneuver is not successful, then we do the second maneuver 
where the pelvic hand reaches uh, mo the most easily accessible fetal shoulder, which is then pushed towards the anterior surface of the chest. And this maneuver often abducts both shoulders of the fetus, which in turn produces a smaller bisacromial diameter. Now, this permits displacement of the anterior shoulder from behind the symphysis. The next maneuver is the Gaskin maneuver, or what we call the all force maneuver. The parturient in this maneuver rolls onto her knees and hands, and a downward traction against the baby's head and neck attempts to free the posterior shoulder. Now, the challenges with this maneuver is um, immobility of the patient when she's already given regional anesthesia and the time lost in repositioning the patient. Another maneuver is the posterior axilla sling traction to deliver the posterior arm. With this alternative method, a suction catheter is threaded under the axilla and both ends are brought together above the shoulder. Upward and outward traction on the catheter loop delivers the shoulder. Neonatal injury may include humeral fracture and herbs palsy. Now, the last three maneuvers are what we call the last resort maneuvers. First is the Zavanelli maneuver, and this involves replacement of the fetal head into the pelvis, followed by a cesarean delivery. But we also give tributylene 0.25 mg subcutaneously to produce uterine relaxation when we do the Zavanelli maneuver. Now, the first part of the Zavanelli maneuver is to return the head to an occiput anterior or an occiput posterior position before pushing it um, inwards. Now, the operator should flex the head and slowly push the head back into the vagina. And then after, once or once the head is already pushed back into the vagina, then the cesarean delivery is performed. Another last resort maneuver is fracture of the anterior clavicle of the fetus. Now, deliberate fracturing of the anterior clavicle using the thumb to press it towards and against the pubic ramus can be attempted to free the shoulder impaction. In practice, however, deliberate fracture of a large neonate's clavicle would be very difficult. If successful, the fracture will heal rapidly and is usually trivial compared with brachial nerve injury, asphyxia, or even death of the fetus. Now, we must remember just to avoid puncturing the lungs of the baby when we do this. Another last resort maneuver is symphysiotomy. Now, the intervening symphysial cartilage and much of its ligamental support is cut to widen the symphysis pubis. Maternal morbidity may be significant because doing this maneuver may cause injury to the bladder. Now, for this part, let us now discuss the shoulder dystocia drill. In other words, these are the steps which we can use every time we encounter cases of shoulder dystocia. The first thing to do, of course, is to call for help. Okay? You have to mobilize your assistants and uh, anesthesiologists and the pediatric personnel. Now, initially, we can do a gentle attempt at traction, then a drain the bladder if it is distended. Next is you may have to do a generous episiotomy to, just to afford room or more room posteriorly. The next is you can apply suprapubic pressure and this is preferred by most practitioners because it has the advantage of simplicity. Now only one assistant is needed to provide suprapubic pressure while normal downward traction is applied on the fetal head by the operator. The next is you can do McRoberts maneuver, and this requires two assistants, one for each leg of the mother. Now, each assistant shall grasp the leg and sharply hyperflex it towards the maternal abdomen. Now, these initial maneuvers um, usually resolve most of the cases of shoulder dystocia. Now, if the above maneuvers fail, then you might attempt the next uh, few maneuvers. And uh, next will be the delivery of the posterior arm. Uh, with a fully extended arm, however, this is usually difficult to accomplish. You can also do the, or attempt to do the wood corkscrew maneuver and also do the Rubin maneuver. Now, if all of this still fail, then you can do the last resort maneuver that I already told you about, which are the Zevanelli maneuver, symphysiotomy, and the clidotomy. For doing the shoulder dystocia drill, you only have a time limit of less or equal to 4 minute stops. Okay, So you cannot go beyond 4 minutes because going beyond 4 minutes will likely produce a hypoxic baby 
and probably fetal death. So here are some of the mnemonics for the management of shoulder dystocia. So we have the helper mnemonics. So H stands for help, which is call for help. E, evaluate for episiotomy. L, legs, meaning you hyperflex the legs in a McRoberts position. P, for pressure, that's suprapubic pressure. E is enter the maneuvers or perform the internal rotation. R, remove the posterior arm. And another R is roll the patient into all of fours or what we call the Gaskin maneuver. Now, another set of mnemonics that can help you remember the shoulder dystocia drill is the mnemonics B calm. So B stands for breathe, do not push. E, elevate the legs into McRoberts position. C, call for help. A, apply suprabupic pressure. L, enlarge the vaginal opening by doing an episiotomy. And M, do the maneuvers by delivering the posterior arm or perform rotational maneuvers. And lastly, we have the alarm or mnemonics. A stands for apply suprapubic pressure and ask for help. L, for legs, hyperflex the legs or what we call the McRoberts maneuver. A, for anterior shoulder disimpaction or suprapubic pressure. R, release the posterior shoulder. M, maneuver of woods or the woods core screw maneuver. E, episiotomy. And R, roll onto all fours. Now that's it for my lecture. Thank you for watching. And please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site, Dokina Bigaine. Thank you.